So we have to look at each other? <laughs> <laughs> well, we get into going round and round, pushing the envelope. And it's pretty reminiscent of the first time we met. I mean, that's still going on. Why do you do this? And how come you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, oh, no. Well, it was like, you know, when I was, when I was in Switzerland, I was giving lots of lessons. And I had lots of students, you know, when I was, was still in Venezuela. And, and I had a friend who was a banjo builder, and he built, you know, banjos, but on a very, you know, it was just like a lot of small banjo builders in the U.S., you know, they would build, you know, maybe a banjo every every month or two months, you know. And he was even, you know, it was, he had a full-time job. He built, you know, nice instruments, and, and but he just couldn't fill the need for the banjos, right? So I was, we started working with the, with the music store in Winterthur, and you probably remember that Bauer because all of a sudden you had orders coming in from Switzerland, you know, mainly for Sierras. Mm -hmm. And it was because um, I had over the course of a, of, a, of a number of years, I had, you know, about 250 students, you know. So that doesn't seem maybe like a lot, but it's, but, you know, I would give them two hours every month, you know, because they would come from fairly far away sometimes. And so I give them two hours in a row you know, four hours, sometimes it became three hours, you know, and, and they would, and they needed banjos. So they, uh, so I thought, I looked, I saw an ad from your company in Fred's magazine, and I saw that there was, a, or banjo newsletter, one of the two, and I saw there was a Sierra model, and it says uh, three ply rim and bronze tone ring, and, you know, it looked like this is really, it's got all the things you need, you know, from a good sounding banjo, and and so I thought, and the price was really good. So I so I, so I said to to Bauer, you know, Hamon Bauer at the time, I said, why don't you look at the Deering, you know, and see if you can get some Deering banjos. And I don't know how he ordered them, but you know, he started carrying them, and I would just, you know, send my students to to him to buy the banjos. You know, I wouldn't buy the banjos, but I would send all my students. I said. You know, and at the time, I I don't know, they were in Switzerland, they were like around 2,000 francs or something, you know, I mean, very affordable, you know, banjo, because my friend's banjo at the time, you know, with all the effort he put in and everything, you know, they were a lot more expensive. And so, uh, or they maybe were, sometimes they were less, I can't remember really, but, but then all of a sudden, you know, but the banjos came, and my students came, you know, show me the banjo, oh, I got the banjo, you know, you said I should get, you know, and so, and they were all really good banjos, but they were... They had sometimes, you know, you know, they had a different tone ring or they had something different, you know. And so I was very curious, you know, of what 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 is decision making, you know, at Deering Company. Anyway, we were invited to play Merlefest. So I never thought I'd ever gonna meet you. You know, I seen a picture of you and Janet in the mansion instead of where you sit on the porch the banjo and the dulcimer, you know, I mean, the dulcimer, I think it was at the time, you know, mountain dulcimer, and Janet wears, you know, scarf, you know, on her hair, you sit there, and it's just great atmosphere, but, but I don't know, how did we meet? There was a backstage, more of us? We sat down to have dinner, because they always serve dinner behind the stage, and we just come back for dinner, and we sat down at the table, and you and Uwe were sitting on the other side of the table. You saw my name tag, and you said, you're Greg Deering? How come you do this to your banjos? And how come you do that to your banjos? And, why not? <laughs> and just on and on, and I, and, and I had, didn't know who you were, and I didn't know who the gentleman sitting next to you was, which was Uwe, yeah. and I happened to notice Uwe, and Uwe's gone. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but... You went on and on and on, just nonstop. And then at one point, you paused for a minute, or for just a brief moment, and I said, well, you know, more than 50% of the way a banjo sounds is who's playing it. And you smiled and you leaned back and you said, no, it's more like 80%. <laughs> yeah, I always... I was a smart ass. I, I guess I still am, you know. I mean, I just, yesterday was funny, you know, you, you gave me the plaque at the staff meeting here at the Banjo Company. I was very, very happy to receive them. 15 years now working together. Yeah. And on the plaque it says, at one point, 
it was not always easy to work with a German banjo player. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good, Greg. You know, yeah, but it also, uh, later on, said, but we wouldn't have it any other. Way. I know, I know, no, 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 no. It was just that. That's the opening line is really perfect, you know, because Uwe would tell you the same thing, my brother or Joel. <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, it's it's just I love banjos, and I I always wanted to understand them better, and I you know just like you, and we we. we I was working with um, Bobby Lauer, my friend in Switzerland. I learned a lot from him, you know, because he was also, he had a credit card and he could order things from America. So we ordered, you know, first quality parts. We ordered, you know, all kinds of parts, you know, from everywhere and tried out, you know, these different parts and tried to learn from them. Also with old instruments that we would come across and take them apart, you know, and analyze them and, you know, saw them apart and be reckless with them, you know, pretty much, you know. I mean, when I think about it today, you know, we wasted a lot of good stuff, but but we learned. And so, because we were in this, because being in Switzerland, it wasn't like, it wasn't like being in America, you know, because there wasn't that much, you know, banjo. But it's like you go, you, you, you look at these banjos and you say, well, there's a different tone ring in this one. Why did they do that? Why, what's their decision-making process? And the reality of that is it wasn't so much oh, we decide we're going to use this tone ring instead. It's the foundry that poured our castings didn't get our castings done. Mm -hmm. Or the machinist that was machining them for us at the time, because I didn't have my first lathe yet, didn't get them done. And we had to pay the rent. Yeah, And so... We call up Dick Coolish and say, we need to buy some tone rings. So we call Ryan up and say, we need to buy some tone rings. So it would vary here and there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as long as we could get our castings and as long as we can get a machine, I had more control over the machining process when we got our first lathe, which was a 1928 South Bend, which we still have and yeah. still use every day. Yeah. Um, but from your perspective, out in the field, looking at them, why did they do this? It's a logical thing to wonder about. You know, they have this way they're doing it. Why would they change it? When we're back there struggling, starting up a brand new company from nothing, and the rent's due, and we we can't sit around and wait yeah, for the foundry. No, 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 no. I, I, you explained that all to me, you know, and, and I think, but in that moment back there, you know, on the backstage, I think we instantly became friends. We did. You know, I think that was just, it just clicked, you know, we had so much fun talking to a banjo and I was walking away, you know, that afternoon, you know, from that and I said to him, this is fantastic, you know. For the first time, I could really talk to somebody who actually runs a company, and I really like the guy, and I like his wife. You know, they're really good people. You know, that was an interesting Merle Fest because that was in the beginning days of the banjo contest that they used to have at Merle Fest. Yes, right. And Peter Wernick was running that, and he had me being one of the judges. Uh -huh. And it was a blind contest where the judges don't get to know the name, they don't get to see the players. And on the final round, there was one player that was playing super fast. And Pete Wernick would come in and be part of the final round of judging. Uh -huh. And um, before I knew you, he goes, that sounds like Jens Kruger. Well, but I wasn't in there. You weren't in there. It was just because he was playing real fast. Yeah. But at the time, I didn't know what that meant. And yeah. it wasn't until after we met you behind stage, and then later on we got to hear you play, I went, Oh my. But I don't know if you remember when it was the end of the festival and you were heading home and you, you stopped on your way out, stopped by our booth um, after we were packing up and we sent you home with a good time. Basically. Oh, yeah, I will never forget that, you know, because I, I, I will. And at that time, we had no business relationship. We just wanted you to have it.